From Los Angeles, the home of film and television, this is Film Music Live, a webcast featuring outstanding composers, orchestrators, filmmakers, and more from the world of music for film, television, and video games, talking about their work and answering your questions. Film Music Live is sponsored by the Film Music Network and Film Music Institute. And now the host of Film Music Live, Daniel Schweiger. Hi everyone, I'm Daniel Schweiger, and welcome to Film Music Live, the show where you get to ask the questions to today's top composers. I'm very happy to have you here. From seasoned composers showing new tricks up their sleeves to the inventive work of auspicious relative newcomers, Marvel Movies and Television continues to be a crafty wellspring of creativity, no more so than with the fresh appeal of composer Natalie Holt, who seems to have put the good in the Marvel Universe's most beloved villain for Disney Plus's Loki. Long established in her native England with nearly 50 projects since she began scoring shorts in 2005, Holt's credits have included many series of Great Expectations and The Honorable Woman, along with episodes of Wallander, Nightfall, and Victoria, which saw her co-nominated for a primetime Emmy. But if there's a program that's picked up comic book movie fans' ears the world over, then it's Loki. Her scoring spans time, the universe, and emotions from cunning humor to heart-rending drama, scoring a supervillain that Thor and Avengers fans have come to love way more than hate, Holt's fusion of 1950s theremin sci-fi, state-of-the-art electronica, old Norse instrumentation, and yearning melody for a character literally in love with himself have been some of the best surprises for tricksters amuck in time, showing a singular composing voice that have made musical admirers wonder about her own secret origins. And now let's welcome a composer who hears the good and the bad guy with her delightfully mischievous score for Loki, Natalie Holt. Hi. <laughs> It, it's great having you here. Um, you know, I think probably, you know, some of the, the happiest surprises you can have is just hearing someone who seems to have come from nowhere. Uh, and it's like, who is this person? Uh, it, it, and again, this because the music is so striking alongside, you know, the show itself. So for people who are wondering, who is Natalie Holt? Fill us in on your own secret origins of how you got to this point. <laughs> um, well, I guess. Uh, my mum's a music teacher, um, and my grandmother was a violinist, so I think music's in the family a bit. Um, that's probably an <laughs> origin story. And I think the wanting to be a film composer started off with um, listening to E.T. Uh, when I was five <laughs> and and just falling in love with John Williams' music um, and wanting to do wanting to do that, but not knowing how. Um, and then just finding a pathway to get there from studying the violin and then going to film school um, and then playing in a quartet for a few years and then assisting other composers and then now finally getting to to do it myself. <laughs> so tell me about your scoring experience before, you know, Loki came along, how you developed your, your chops as it were, uh, you know, especially in television. Um, so, I mean... Well, I was um, I went to a kind of a specialist music school from the age of eleven, and we'd have like harmony theory, composing lessons, improvisation lessons from like eleven. Um, so I think I've always been improvising, which is kind of helpful for becoming a composer, I guess. Um, and yeah, I guess. Um, I think your sound just develops as you get more kind of bold in your in your what you want to say in the world as well. Like I don't think I think if I had scored Loki ten years ago, it would have probably been a little bit more timid. I think I, just got, <laughs> I think I'm kind of well, a bit more bold as I get older. <laughs> Well, well, timid Loki is not, and and neither n neither do you. I mean, you had you had a a very auspicious television uh, debut <laughs> when you did that. I think Loki would himself would have approved. Uh, <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I personally would have used actual chickens, uh, but w when you did that, were you like, oh boy, like no one knows who I am and whatever? D did people care? Did you just basically get like a round of applause when you walked into the office after that? <laughs> no, I got like. Yeah, no, it was definitely not a round of applause by 
I think everyone was just a bit shocked. I think I was a bit shocked. Like, um, I kind of had a weird point when I transitioned from being in in the quartet to being a composer. Um, I went to live on a commune in Thailand, on a, a permaculture farming commune. <laughs> so I was kind of planning to like give it all up and become um, like grow vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah i don't i don't know that was a bit of a mischievous thing to have done and when i was younger yeah as i say but but in a way though that kind of i guess would kind of make you understand who the character is or just that long ago that you kind of would have because it's not the first like you know anita bryant with the pie in the face and all that kind of stuff but i think in a way it kind of in a way it kind of maybe clued you into a mischievous character you know in a way just having fun you know i guess yeah i guess so i think i mean the thing that led the score for loki for, for me was just like um watching tom hiddleston's performance and just getting yeah just being finding kind of a connection with his character like i think everyone can connect to to that kind of you know kind of cheekiness that he that he has and that sort of he's he's kind of a lovable villain isn't he <laughs> I think absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I think everyone loved them after this. You know, and, and one thing I love about Marvel is that they really always take a chance on new talent. You know, people who haven't really gotten kind of gotten this kind of a major break. How did you come aboard the show? Um, so uh, there was just like a general call out that um, came through from my agent. Um, just it was like a, a untitled Marvel project needing a sort of epic, spacey. Sorry, my cat. <laughs> my cat's bothering me. <laughs> um, like needing a kind of epic space um, kind of score. So I um, I put together a showreel and sent that off. I didn't know what it was for. And then um, I think Kate just like liked what I'd sent. So I, I then got a meeting with um, Kate Heron and and Kevin Wright, who's the kind of creative producer. Um, who's a, and that yeah so I met both of them and then read the script and and I had to kind of do a Bake Off style um, pitch with a scene um, which was which was from episode one where they kind of go down the lift and then into the time theatre so I had to score that for them and I think a few other composers scored that too and then yeah I got the job from that point which was amazing. What? What do you think was the secret as to why you got what what did you do to that demo that made it made it the winner, do you think? I don't know. I guess it just my instinct for it and Kate's vision for it aligned and it was just luck, some luck there, I guess, in just doing the, the doing what Kate was looking for. And and I used um a live lots of live instruments because I play the violin, so I often kind of play um on top of my samples to make them give them a bit more life and um and I added um <clears throat> Charlie Draper who's the theremin player who I worked with on this as well and he was playing on that demo um <clears throat> and the Loki theme um I came up with after I read the first script and so that that Loki theme is there it was in in the first demo as well so yeah so they only gave you the first script. I mean, did you have like any idea as to how, where this would all end? Or are you just basically kind of given one script at a time? Um, I was given the first two scripts for the meeting for, for, you know, for doing the pitch. So I kind of knew only up to the end of episode two, which, um, and then once I got the job, um, I got all six episodes and, um, and then Kate went back to shoot um because obviously they've been they've been shut down because of COVID, so um, at that point I was getting through the rushes of of Kang and or, or, you know what happens in episode six. I was getting to see as I was coming up with the suite of themes. So I wrote that theme for Kang really early on, and I was like, oh, this should be the TVA theme. Um, and actually, the TVA theme that we think of, you know, as, as kind of connected with Loki's actually Kang's theme all along. It's been there, seeded all the way through. So that was kind of fun to to come up with that Kang theme really early on as well and know that it was all heading there. Wow, that's really cool. I, I you know, I didn't really hear that until you, you told me that. I mean, you know, all I could say is you had me at the theremin. 
when I heard the theorem <laughs> in the first episode, I'm like, what the? Uh, I just, where, how did that idea, because again, you know, the, the TVA is kind of, has this wonderful kind of retro uh, design, you know, to it, which harkens kind of back to Googie architecture from like the 50s and the 60s. Was that just an automatic clue for you to use the theorem in? Well, actually, um, Kate had had put um, Clara Rockmore, Rockmore, the um, theremin player, the famous theremin player from the 1950s, um, her rendition of the Swan, and that had been in her like mu musical mood board that she'd sent in as her director pitch. So Kate had wanted to use a theremin, um, and she discussed this with me in in the first meeting that we had in my kind of job interview. Um, and I, I'd heard that Clara, I'd heard the same recording of, and and fallen in love with the theremin and and weirdly like worked with Charlie Draper, the theremin player, like a month before on a, on a different project. So I kind of had his number and, and yeah, I wanted to work with him. He's basically just like a collector of, um, he's got a 1929 RC, um, which is one of those original instruments, which would which you'd hear in all those nineteen fifties B mo movies, because that was that was kind of always the standard, because that was the electronic instrument that everybody had at that point in time. Um, and yeah, we, I was so lucky to be able to work with one of those original instruments, because there's hardly any left in working order. So yeah, yeah I, I mean, you know, it's so funny because I just like watched. Uh... It came from outer space, which might be the most theremin centric of these movies ever. I mean, did you? Because again, in some of the scoring, you really just so brilliantly capture that 1950 sound. Did you do any research, watch a lot of these movies to kind of nail what you were going to go for there? Yeah, I think so. Well, and it wasn't just um, it, for me, though, because the TVA is like multi strands of like there's some 70s in there and the time theater that's a bit of a kind of orange clockwork orange kind of um some of the graphics and stuff feels like a hodgepodge so i was listening to lots of um bbc radiophonics workshop and delia derbyshire and um wendy carlos and and things like that as well and one of my tutors at film school when because i went to national film television school to do my masters um, and my tutor there was Peter Howell, who was the writer of the 1980s version of the Doctor Who theme. So there's, there's like a whole mashup of, of, of influences in there. Um, but yes, I guess I guess it just all sorts of things come together and fusing in, in, in the style, not just not just the 1950s B movie style. <laughs> You know, one thing I really love it just about the Thor universe in general is how they kind of gave it a science fiction spin, right, from the first film that, you know, maybe these weren't gods so much as like kind of super powered aliens. And Loki really takes that whole science fiction aspect of Thor to a whole other level. I mean, now, you know, having loved E.T. as a kid, were you just like a fan of science fiction films to begin with, even going into this? Yes. For sure, I, I was like um, a huge Star Wars fan, <laughs> um, and I, re I, I really was into kind of like George Orwell and like dystopian, utopian um, kind of those ideas as well of of, of alternate universes and and like the um, Man in the High Castle and those you know um, those kind of have always really captured my imagination. So. Yeah, definitely. That that's always been a, an interest of mine. So that that leads us again. There's so many wonderful styles, uh, you know, in in the score in the in the series, and it actually leads to our first uh, questions. Uh, first question is from Eric Hine, and actually one of my favorite cues in the entire series. Could you talk about Wagner? and the musical illusion becoming reality. And for me, this is the amazing uh, scene of Richard E. Grant sacrificing himself. And it suddenly, I was like, oh my God, that's uh, Ride of the Valkyries. Um, and a completely different God universe as well. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, so I, as I said, like I came up with that, the, the Loki theme in the pitch, but I knew that I wanted something kind of classical and with a lot of flair and panache over the top and I wanted I kind of wanted to I think Wendy Carlos inspired me with Clockwork Orange because she used 
she you know beethoven on synths but it has that calling to the kind of um symphonic repertoire which i which i thought would work for loki so i was trying lots of like little kind of calling rips like, over the top of that loki theme um like there was some da -da 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 -da, that kind of you know finickety mozart trills over the top at one point um and then i just that you know from ride of the valkyries just seemed to sit over the top and give it that kind of flair and drama that i was looking for so um that was that that ride of the valkyries thing was there and then i was like oh it's perfect as well because it's ride of the valkyries <laughs> and and then when you know that that idea just came to me and when in the meeting when i watched that scene um with Richard E. Grant and I just kind of mentioned it to Kate and Kevin Wright and sort of said, shall I, shall I just try doing like a version of Ride of the Valkyries here? It feels like could be could be a moment for it because it's like he's building Asgard and, and, and we've been kind of using that over the top of Loki's theme anyway. So it's kind of cool to connect classic Loki to Loki. And so they were like, yeah, try it. Woo, you know, classical mashup. Um, let's have a let's see what it sounds like, and it seemed to work. So that's how that kind of happened. No, here's the here's my cat. So <laughs> we both have a cat off screen doing this. Um, get on my lap, and there's not room. <laughs> well, she could be in the, in the court or something like that. Um, so you know what's what's great, especially the first episode of Loki, really just kind of you know really hit me with just how many wonderful styles. I mean, you have this great kind of riff on old industrial music when you see Miss Minutes. You've got like a, a D, you know, the DB Cooper rumba happening. How, how important was that first episode and just kind of establishing this this kind of humorous tone, uh, you know, that the score could go into, to, like literally a score that could go all over the place. Um, yeah, so I think what happened was, you know, we'd have these meetings, like usually in TV, you're in, you're in a rush, like you don't generally get as much time with TV as you do with films, or, or I've not experienced it. Um, but because of because of COVID, and because they the pr production had been halted, and, you know, everyone had had to stop for lockdown, um, we sort of seemed to have a bit of extra time, which was which meant that those moments where you'd probably use use a source track, um, and they did have a source track on that DB Cooper scene, which worked, which was kind of um, in that style, like the samba kind of style. Um, and Kate was like, oh, once we've finished kind of scoring what we need to score with score, like maybe we could try and replace a few of those source tracks and connect them up with the Loki theme and like, Put the TVA theme in in that um you know kind of instruction video at the beginning of episode one and like the moment where they're kind of having that fight with all the different Loki's um that kind of prog rock version of the Loki theme um and all those moments which is just basically kind of unifying the what the world of the score and and kind of hammering home Loki's theme um was just fun to have time to to do those um yeah it was really fun <laughs> now we've got a uh, question from uh sachi danan um can you tell us a bit about your scoring template uh, does it vary drastically from project to project and what are some of your favorite sample libraries <laughs> i i'm um my demos are like horrible i'm, I'm not like massively technical because um I used to write on manuscript basically and I, I, I wasn't really into computers until I really really had to be um, and like be, being a violinist as well I'd always just relied on on playing everything and recording audio for everything so my um, you know there's some people who's so amazing at making samples sound real and that is not my skill I'm just I'm, I'm kind of using it as an intermediary before I can get my hands on on the orchestra and put loads of um, audio onto it, um, but I do um, I use Logic and um, I think I guess Spitfire are probably my biggest um, collection. I, I I was lucky enough, like I um I got in a Black Friday sale. I think I kind of purchased like the whole Spitfire 
um, you know, range. So I, I think their BBC Symphony Orchestra um, orchestral samples are, are really good. Um, but yes, I don't know. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> you know, one thing I particularly love about the you know about the series is that it actually gets quite emotional at points and you and you really get this sense of sadness that maybe all this this e seeming evil or mischief that loki does is just masking a real sadness that the character has and you call up this kind of norse instrument or nordic instrument sound that in a way really captures that oh yeah that was um that was i was just again it's like um i'd been to this concert uh, three years before and heard this group called the lodestar trio which was set up by my friend max bailey who's a, a violinist um and he was just doing kind of versions of bach with these uh, eric um rivedale and olav look look i cannot say either of their surnames so i, I kind of don't try to but um Olaf and Eric, who who are our nickel harper and hard anger fiddle players in, in, on Loki, um, and I heard them in a concert in London, and then just always had their amazing sound in my head. It was sort of like a magical violin with loads of overtones, and um, and just also I think that because as a classically trained violinist, I feel a bit limited in my you know, if I want to improvise something, it's always it always sounds a bit formal and classical. And when you hear folk musicians who are fully like their their go to improvisations and inflections, and have always got so much soul. And yeah, so I'd send them over something I'd played on the violin or some something I'd done on the piano, and then get it back from them. And it just they kind of added that extra heart to it of, of an emotional playing. So yeah, I just, I feel so lucky that I got all the, all those musicians playing for me as well. I owe them so much. <laughs> now that kind of leads to our, uh, another question from Louis Virtualini. Um, hi Natalie, can you talk about what it was like to play in George Michael's Symphonica tour? <laughs> yeah, I was playing the viola um, and um, he, it was it was really cool. Like it it was so amazing to to meet George Michael and such a kind of privilege to obviously it was the last tour of his life and and he, he was clearly not a well man sadly um, and I think that tour was he wanted to give it to his fans and and it was really special to be part of that and and there there, there was a kind of sadness about it as well because a lot of the songs were kind of soulful and quite slow and deep and and looking back you kind of wonder if that was George like knew he was approaching the end of his life I don't know but um yeah I've, I feel lucky to have toured with him and had that experience yeah again I really loved I, one thing I love about Wham is just this beautifully lush uh, you know symphonic sound that the that the band had um you know it seemed to me you know it's interesting because like every episode you know, it kind of had its own little tonal identity, like you'd have one episode that was like maybe a dark thriller, uh, you know, another one that was an outright comedy. But in the last episode, it seems that maybe the it was pretty challenging, I imagine, because essentially, you know, some things you have Irving the Explainer, and in the last episode, you have Kang the Explainer. So again, it's it's very much a dialogue-driven sequence, like that it's quite a long time of, of them sitting at a table and him kind of, you know, describing the timeline and how all this works. How difficult was it to score and spot that whole scene? Uh, <laughs> um, episode six was like the most changed um in the edit like emma just um it, it kind of got reduced quite a lot and the editor had this idea of of that montage at the beginning and and um it was very different like when i saw it i think it, it had an extra 10 or 15 minutes in it the first time i watched it through so i kind i i knew i had that kang theme but i didn't i kind of got to the whole episode six as a whole kind of in chronological order so I'd, I'd scored one to five and then I dug into six last and weirdly episode six felt the easiest to write um I, I felt like it just like the idea to have um a requiem when Kang was giving his backstory 
um you know he's he's talking about his origins and and he he does that whole speech with that little kind of those models that pop up on the table and i when i watched it through i just again i just kind of suggested it to kate and kevin like we could sort of score this like a sort of salieri and and, and mozart you know that kind of it's his it's his thing that he that he's giving giving to them before he's killed and um there should be something like a bit funereal and, and like a requiem about it because he's yeah and and so then I had the choir and put, kind of got to I basically used all I even had some bits from Miss Minutes um in there and and I just kind of fused everything that I'd done from one to five and and put it into that sort of emotional requiem for 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 he who should not he who remains because he's not Kang at that point so that's uh, sort of like his his requiem and then um episode six I loved like it felt like Bartok and and you know I took that Loki theme and the variant theme and turned it on its head and made it completely atonal and um I yeah I, I really enjoyed writing episode six and it, and it came really quickly I basically kind of just was writing it and watching it and hearing it as I was watching it because I guess I was so into the project by that point, I guess. <laughs> so we've got a question from Tebling who starts off, thanks so much for joining us, Natalie. Your score is amazing. Uh, for a given scene, how do you determine the balance of traditional orchestral colors for synth colors and everything in between? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, my cat. I should I should have used her. She's. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't that is, know. That is a... <laughs> um, I think you just have to kind of. Um, I kind of hear when I'm watching a, a scene. Um, I I kind of just hear how I think it's meant to go, um, and then and then it's like muddling my way through my dreadful demos and programming everything and, and involving other musicians and you know kind of I can kind of get the score using Sibelius a bit more together than I can my um samples if that makes any sense so yeah it's just kind of watching the scene and and, and then getting all the elements that I need and and then I, I kind of do a premix before I send it over to um okay I'm gonna put my <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna put you be, so does your cat have like a gold helmet? <laughs> there we go. Sorry, Ziggy. I'll come and stroke you later. She's just distracting me too much. <laughs> um, so yeah, what's the thing? So I, I premix it, and and I kind of have a labeling system. Um, and I'd always send. I think my by the time things go over to my engineer oh she's come back in hey. <laughs> so okay i'm gonna stop being distracted by my cat i love cats um, it's all good <laughs> <laughs> um and so yeah i kind of premix everything so i'm i'm kind of balance i'm balancing i think the thing the demos that i got to jake were roughly set as, as as how i wanted them but he he yeah it was great to work with him because he he mixed into 5.1 which is like i can't do it in my studio because i've only got stereo set up but um and then he he was just kind of he did experiment a bit away from my demo sometimes and sometimes i was like oh no could you go back to what how i had it and, and then other times he, he like the db cooper his mix for that i just it was quite different from how i'd had it and that was really a joy to to hear his mix for that. So, yeah, I had not really worked with an engineer much before this project, but um, yeah, it was great to get to work with Jake Jackson on this. So, was the whole thing scored during pandemic? And and if it was, how difficult was it? Um, yes, the whole thing. I never met anyone in person. I like met Kate Heron for the first time yesterday. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh my goodness. We we had an episode six watching party because um, she's from Kent as well and she's back um, living here at the moment. Um, 
So yeah, we met. We I met Kate for the first time, and Emma, the editor, and and Charlie, the ceremony player. Like I had not met any of these people in real life for the for the last year and a half. So that was really cool to watch episode six with them. Um, yeah, just everything, the whole thing, even the Jake, the engineer. It was all remote. But wow. actually, um, some of it. Um, I actually thought mixing. Because we used audio movers, and so I was. It was cool to hear the mix through my speakers. Because obviously you're so used to how things sound on your own speakers, and often, often if I'd gone to mix in a different studio, you'd kind of get get the mix home and then be a bit surprised by how it was sounding. So that was quite nice. I, I feel like I'd do that again, actually. So some some of it's a positive. <laughs> Well, no, it sounds terrific. I mean, you know, the sonically, it sounds great. Uh, here's a question from Nick. Uh, Hello, I really like the Loki series music. I'm a beginner in film scoring, so I would like to ask, what advice would you give someone who wants to start exploring film, the film scoring world? Um, I don't know. I just, I think I did a, obviously I'd always kind of wanted to do it, but I didn't know how. And I just um, did a module on it at university, but I'm sure I'm, and, and um, I scored, it was like scoring a scene from a film that you want, that you wanted to, like, I just ripped it off, off a horror film, actually. I think it was like a horror film with Michelle Pfeiffer, What Lies Beneath. I scored like ah. uh, that. And, and that was my kind of like project at university. And I just kind of, that was the first time I'd ever used a, I'd use my boyfriend's computer <laughs> um, and just, you know, just get your hands on, on some, on some scenes that you like from films that you like and, and, and get cracking. And, and I just feel like for me, I know I'm not like a composer of symphonies like that. Just if someone said to me, could you write a symphony? I would not, I wouldn't be able to know where to start. Like it, I don't have that in me for just coming up with things from thin air. Like I need, the architecture of a scene and the emotion of the characters. And then I can know what music I think should go with it. Um, so for me, it was like really obvious, like this is my calling. Like I, I love those combinations. And I think, cause I was always interested in writing, like I wanted to study English literature if I wasn't gonna go and play the violin at the Royal Academy. So um, yeah, I was always interested in drama and story and, and film composing is just like storytelling with music, I think. You know, for me, I think some of my coolest moments, like watching movies, is watching the bad guy turn good. I mean, like the ultimate case, Darth Vader suddenly grabbing the Emperor and throwing him down the, down the reactor shaft. I mean, who would have known that he would have cloned himself? But um, <laughs> Have have you always enjoyed kind of like maybe watching characters who you thought who just came across as being totally evil and then suddenly there's some kind of redemption or they suddenly turn good? And if you have, how how did that play into the way that you tried to capture Loki? Um yeah, I think I'm I mentioned this in my meeting, very first meeting with Kate, that um that Loki kind of reminded me of Alex from Clockwork Orange and that that you you feel this empathy for someone who's who's doing these appalling acts like and you yeah you kind of know that they're bad but that and their redemption is so painful like um I, I think clockwork or obviously it's more complex than that um but yeah I I was sort of and the at the way Alex play, is is played in the Kubrick film as well with that sort of you know his his henchman and that kind of walking along in the in those white suits I don't know for some reason that 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 kind of um, I had that in my mind when I and connected it with Loki um, and I I think that resonated with Kate as well she saw something of of Clockwork Orange in in, in the story. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I I really I I watched um A Hidden Life, like the Terence Malick film at Cannes Film Festival a couple of years ago. And like the the main character in that, that's not I don't know, like I, I can't sort of that's like a story of someone who's who's completely resolute and, and will not do wrong and, and I I came out of that movie just completely broken. Like I I 
sobbing like that's I think just st storytelling and the power of storytelling and 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 exploring character that's just whether that's good or bad whatever I that's just something that I'm, I'm always drawn to now I'd love to talk about your approaches uh you know in terms of a change in character Lady Loki who you know obviously be way before you know that she's a woman you know is portrayed as a psychopathic maniac only to discover she ends up being the heroine uh and in the same way uh mobius's character you know ends up rebelling against the tva um tell, tell me about scoring these two characters um well so yeah i i i don't know why i kind of imagined mobius when i read the script i hadn't seen um yeah, the, when I, I don't know, I imagined him being like a bit more um, slow and lumbering and, and like a sort of police pre precinct kind of cop eating donuts kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't play like that at all. He sort of was like quite quick and nimble and and um, and him and, and Tom just seemed to have like a real natural kind of connection to each other uh, that... It was, yeah, I just thought that was kind of a really fun element to the story. Like whenever you see those two on screen, there's like a sort of, you can feel feel them kind of vibing off each other. Um, but yeah, Mobius, I guess, I think his theme came to me. I was just knowing that he had that penchant for jet skis and <laughs> had all these like 90s jet ski magazines in his desk. Um, and I was thinking like, I wonder what kind of music he'd listen to in his, little TVA cabin where he goes back to sleep at night. And uh, I was imagining it might be Bon Jovi. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, you know, like power rock from the night, from the eighties. Um, and so that inspired his theme, his theme, like a sort of guitar um, kind of, yeah, it's got some eighties guitar vibe to it. Power chords. And how about Lady Loki? Um, and her theme, I've just been roasted on Twitter about, <laughs> I said something about um, how her theme and, 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 and Loki's mother was connected and everybody's like, what? <laughs> like, um, you know, incest. But it's it's not, I think it's it's complex because Lady Loki is a version of Loki. It's, it, it's sort of a Narcissa, Narcissus, um, he's falling in love with himself or is he, you know, he's he, there's he's feeling really complex emotions because he's meeting a female version of himself and it's not his sister it's different it's it's um and I kind of wondered whether one aspect of what he feels when he looks at her you know he's he's not had a good obviously that scene with Sith where he's cut off her hair after they've been together and you know he's not had an easy love life and his strongest female connection so far has been to his mother so that's why I said, you know, I think that the way that he's feeling this strong connection to a woman that he's only ever felt before with his mother, which is why I felt that their um, themes should be connected. Um, and they, they are connected. They, they're both using these um, traditional kind of Nordic folk instruments. But Sylvie's theme's a lot darker than his mother's theme. And it's, um, yeah, it's got this kind of, she's been living her life as a child growing up in apocalypses and murdering people. So there's there's something incredibly dark about her theme and I got to turn her theme on its head and blend it with Kang's theme and then do this that cello solo when she sits back down after she's stabbed him um in the end of episode six sorry spoiler alert um <laughs> um that's and she realizes that he was telling the truth that that for me I was like I want that to just break your heart that moment um hopefully it does <laughs> absolutely i mean now you mentioned about forums i mean what's it like for you to you know come from you know essentially high art series to becoming like one of the main talking points of this gigantically popular show and then suddenly like you're thrown out there into the universe you become <laughs> fan arguments and what, what what's it like for you to to suddenly be part of that whole thing I think it's it's been kind of nice because obviously i've struck up quite a, oh she's she's back Shush. Um, <laughs> Don't make her mad. Um, we know what happens in Loki when you make an animal mad. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, 
Yeah, no, I think because Sophia Del Martino and and and, um, and Kate Heron, we've all we, we've all kind of, I guess, experienced it together. So it's been kind of nice. Like I messaged Kate after that after the I, I showed her the 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 thing that I'd been quoted in the interview and all these like incest things that were going on on Twitter and Kate was like, just put it on, fil filter out those comments and. Um, you know, you can just put it on, put things that you're putting on social media on on friends only if 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 you're finding it too much. So, I thought that was quite good advice. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm so sure here's a question. Okay. Off. Oh no, sorry, I'm interrupting. Uh, here's a question from Andrew John Natalie. Uh, this is an amazing piece of work for a great series. Thank you. The obvious one, have overtures been made for you to score a future Marvel movie? Most of the upcoming ones are spoken for, admittedly, but which characters, team, apart from Loki, would you like the opportunity to musically accompany? Oh, um, so, oh, God, I'd love to carry on. Kang I I really enjoyed episode six so much um and I loved that kind of you know atonal mayhem and the way he played that character just I loved his energy and um, that John Majors brought brought to that part so yeah I'd, I'd 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 love to keep to keep working for Marvel if they'd if they'd have me <laughs> um we'll have to see I, I think they will. Now, here is a question from uh, David Hand. Uh, good evening from North Lincolnshire. Uh, did the Marvel producers give you a free reign on the type of music they wanted for the Loki series, or did you want to have a specific guidelines and time constraints? Um, so I, get, I had to send, they were very much like hands off, um, and crafting it was all kind of me and Kate and Kevin Wright, the um, creative producer. And then like the suite had to go past the execs. I think that I did as well. I think my pitch went to the execs. So they were obviously like the timekeepers kind of overseeing that everything was going, running smoothly, but very hands off. And um, after I did my run at episode one, that got sent off to the three, you know, Louis, um, uh, so what oh gosh victoria and kevin feige and um yeah i just had one note back from from what i did from episode one which was like push it further so you know that they, they were just like push it be bold and experimental and we'll go we, we want it to be different so and, the, and they all said you know disregard anything you don't have to use anything that we've done before or, like yeah they just wanted something bold and different and it was really cool, to, you know. Though I was, I was kind of like, "Do you think I could have a choir?" <laughs> I'm like, "Yes." And then we recorded. I think we recorded a 16-piece choir to start off with. And I was like, "Can we double this? It's not quite, not quite got the scale." And they're like, "Yeah, sure." So um, that's nice to have that kind of financial support of, of what I wanted to do as well. That was amazing. They were, they were, yeah, they were just kind of whatever you know they were like just write what you want to write and don't be constrained by anything which was amazing couldn't ask for better really no i mean the, the sky is is really the limit you know and one thing you know i just love the main title music you know back in the good old days you'd have like a like a minute to play your main title and you know really luxuriate in the music and now with most of today's shows you've got like about 15 seconds to just get across the idea and again i love the kind of revolving letter number again with that kind of thereminish retro sound for the for the opening 15 seconds whatever of loki how difficult was it for you just to nail that signature sound that would kind of clue you into what the show was um well again like i said um that that suite that i had to write um, for for the when Kate went back, so I got the job, and then I had that month, and I had to present the suite to um, everyone, and Kate, and I think Tom Hiddleston as well, because apparently he was he was playing it on set <laughs> to get him in the mood, which I, I was like, oh my god, amazing! Um, so yeah, that that's that TVA that version of the TVA theme, which was used for the kind of um, black and white ident at the beginning, um, was 
in my in this 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 suite. So and 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 that's unchanged. That's um, I didn't kind of do anything extra to it. That was like my demo version. So really, that 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 fifteen seconds that is the main title was just always there within the suite that you did. Yeah, and then I tried to do when because I I had these orchestral recordings in Budapest, so I thought, oh, I'll try and um, uh, you know, do a version with like bra bigger. May I'll make it bigger and put like strings and brass on it and stuff, and and like I mixed it with Jake into into five point one as well, and I I didn't like it. I I just because I think I'd had that and everyone had had that on since August um, last year. Um, I just used my original, I didn't, I used my original mix and my demo version because I think I was so attached. Yeah. Um, so Matthew McNary, uh, I'm sorry, Matthew Neary, Natalie would love to know if there's going to be a physical CD release. Uh, you know, we have one and three, one through three now is available digitally, but maybe there'll be an album in the future or, you know, an old school LP somehow. Maybe. Well, I think, I think, um, <laughs> Dave Jordan was saying they do a Marvel, they, they release a few of the soundtracks on vinyl every year. Um, I don't think they release all of them. And I, and I haven't heard if, if they're gonna be doing mine yet, but fingers crossed, it'd be cool. I'd love to have a, an album on vinyl, it'd be amazing. When, when you were, you know, just, you know, starting to become a composer, I guess this was probably the CD age for you. I mean, were you just like buying soundtracks or going to stores or just, or was it vinyl or CD for you back in the day? Yeah, I I had a little um like a tape recorder. You know, there's like '80s tape recorders where you press two buttons and then you you can record off the radio. I don't know if you remember those. It was like it was kind of like a little box, and it just had a tape machine, and then you could record and play and rewind and fast forward and stuff. So I had like a um a cassette player, um, and I used to record things I liked on like the John Peel show. <laughs> So I was kind of listening to that on Radio 1. I don't know if you had that show. Um, and like I'd record things I liked in the charts and listen to the, you know, the top, whatever it was, top 100 on a Sunday and, and like record it and then listen to it on my headphones when I was doing my paper round. <laughs> um, and I had a couple of, um, I think I had Vaughan Williams, Lark Ascending and and um, like a, a lot of Mozart quartets um, tapes and, and um yeah, so I was listening to lots on my little headphones in the 90s. And my granddad was like a big, he had a huge vinyl collection, which I, because sadly he passed away, um, of of symphonies and, and different, like you have, he'll have the same piece um, with like Arthur Rubenstein or Glenn Gould or whatever. And he's, he ha he'll have like lots of versions of artists playing. Um, so I've got quite a huge vinyl collection and, broken vinyl player, which I need to sort out soon. <laughs> now, Dale's got a question. Um, you know, can you detail, as you've mentioned uh, in interviews, uh, your old school compositional process ways that pencil and paper still work for you? I think um, for me, if I, if I just like sit down with a sequencer and start like, oh, that sounds good. And, and I, I, I can kind of get, caught up in trying to make stuff sound real like um and then often I'll listen back to what I've done and it it doesn't have a good harmonic kind of centering and it's not got a theme <laughs> like um so I just find and Loki's been the most the most kind of um thematic kind of score that I've written where I've been like obsessed like this these themes need to interact here and I'm gonna oh this happened so I'm gonna like I, I was kind of really led by the direction of the themes with this and and um I wanted everything to kind of story tell and line up and and make sense in that way so um yeah I did find that I was kind of sketching things out and working on cool, interesting chord progressions and 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 just doing it on the piano without loads of samples involved and thinking, oh, I'll have the horn play this part. But my my demo sound horrible. It's just like a really crappy, like everything's being played on a piano, but, I, but I'll like sketch out horn and then I'll put that in on the piano and I'll sketch out like violas and I'll put that part in on, on the piano. And, and 
so yeah it, that's kind of how I how I start how I worked on this it's not how I always work sometimes I'll if it's like a smaller um thing I'll, I'll kind of play things in on the violin and I could I don't always work in that way but that just seemed to be my how my process developed on, on Loki now Michael Carter would love to know what is your go-to instrument when starting a project I, well, I think I'll just answer that. Um, it, it's different changes. But it's generally either the piano or the viola or the violin because those are my my main instruments. Um, so yeah, and I just the piano is kind of all there. Like I just you can kind of yeah imagine how it's going to be when it when you're playing something through on the piano. So yeah, I think I think that would be number one. Now, were you amazed? by the popularity of Alligator Loki. <laughs> How would you I, I, score I, an Alligator Loki show? An alligator, like just if they do a spin-off cartoon series about just the alligator. <laughs> People are demanding um, it. I mean... <laughs> yeah, I think maybe... Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know where we'd start. The Loki theme would be in there somewhere, I guess. Um, we have to find a kind of be like Jaws. We have to do something kind of menacing. With it. Although he's kind of a cute alligator. <laughs> um, now you have a, a Netflix film coming up called Fever Dream. Can you tell us about that? Um, yeah, Fever Dream is um, coming out on Netflix in the autumn, um, and that's very much like a string a kind of chamber string piece which yeah i kind of came up with it's got like a sort of virtuosic violin line that that like soars over the top um which i yeah it was writing that score and and working with claudia lalosa she's um such a talented director um she's peruvian and um the story's set in argentina it's a spanish language film and it's sort of about a strange illness and um, a mother-daughter relationship. And, and it's sort of told in this really beautiful kind of weaving dream, dreamlike way. And it's, it's such a beautiful film. I can't, can't wait for people to see it. How, how has this whole, you know, lockdown experience been for you? I mean, it, it seems for a lot of composers, it's kind of made them look inward and to write more unique and innovative music in a way, just kind of being trapped, I guess, for the lack of a better word. Um, well, I, I, I never kind of felt like that because um, I've got, uh, well, my daughter's just turned seven, but um, so she was kind of five, six through, through, um, through this last year and a half. Um, so homeschooling her and um, my dad's not very well either. Like um, he, yeah, he's he's got dementia. So so I've, I've got like quite a lot of family kind of things which which are ongoing. So it doesn't feel that different because you've got your kid. You've got to kind of educate them and put them to bed, and and they give your life a kind of. Um, I'm sure that lockdown would be very different if, if you were on your own or, or just with kind of adults, but a child just kind of shapes your day in a very specific way. So it, it, it yeah. But in a way, you know, this, this, this particular show has brought a lot of unexpected joy to people though. I mean, you know, it, it's actually, there's a tremendous amount of good energy. Again, maybe not the last episode so much, but, uh, but for the most part, you know, again, it's well, just the kind of the musty thing. television. Yeah, it is. It was. It was kind of joyous, and and I think it was. That was the thing. Like I had my daughter, and she's she's a joy. Like I love spending time with her, and so so it was. Everything's always fun when you're a child, and and you know they they always see the kind of like onwards, and you know they they, they don't get hung up on anything. So um, I feel like Loki's like been a bit like that, and and it's been a great world to be able to escape too so you know the, the chance to work on this show and spend lots of time with my daughter's actually been amazing <laughs> so I can't I've had quite a good like in a as good as possible kind of experience of lockdown but obviously I, I feel kind of callous to say that when it's been so horrific for so many people 
so again, you know, we obviously have a, a super big cliffhanger um, at the at the end of the show. You know, to you know, he's going to evidently show up in Doctor Strange. I've been reading on the net, then go back to you know. Well, James Bond will return. So, <laughs> as, they, as they say in the end credits, where do you see the show going and how crazy can your music get for it? <laughs> oh, I, I really have zero. Um, I know, I obviously know that what happens in, in, in the comics, um, I think there's the, the fans are kind of picking up on, on the fact that Renslayer and Kang. I think were an item in the comics. So the fact that she was in Loki um, tipped some people off that Kang was going to be revealed at the end. But I, I, it was kind of funny seeing people picking up on on some Easter eggs that I, I was like, oh, I don't, I don't think that. But you know, um, yeah, I, I have no idea where it's going. I haven't, I haven't um, been told, um, so I can't. And even if I had, yeah. I wouldn't be able to say. Well, I'm sure we're going to find out. Natalie, I just want to give you a huge thanks. Uh, I think your score for Loki is literally enchanting. And uh, thank you so much for joining us at Film Music Live. I want everyone to watch the complete Loki on Disney Plus with Natalie Holt's soundtracks available on Marvel Music and Hollywood Records. Uh, thanks to our producer, Dale Turner, Mark Northam, Mark Banning, Jana Davidoff, and Alex Beck. And we will see you on the next Film Music Live for John Murphy and the Suicide Squad. Natalie, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye.